handed. I never know which way to go. Well, I've looked forward to this week for a long time for a lot of different reasons. And certainly part of it was to be with these men who I have such great admiration and respect for in the preaching of the gospel. Uh, Dee has been a great influence upon me and thankful for what he has done for so many years in influencing people for good. He and Norma, I don't know any two people who are more loved in the brotherhood than Dee and Norma. And how wonderful it is to get to spend some time with him this week. And of course with Russ, talk to him about how I saved his marriage one time. Jason, uh, Jason is one whose work I have known but have not had the opportunity to be around much. But already after this morning, I see what kind of man he is in the preaching of the gospel, and I do appreciate that so much. Now, 20 years with Kenny Moore is something special. You've only had, what, four here? Uh, it's worth every, every moment. And it was a very special relationship that we shared. And we very much miss Kenny and Beth at the university. I do have one question. Um, Russ was talking about how that Kenny was talking to him about topics. And Russ said he was giving him some ideas of things he'd like to work up to preach. And he finally says to Russ, now, I want you to preach some of those good lessons I've heard you preach other places. I'd really like to hear those. And so, now he didn't say that to me. I gave him some ideas and he came up with one that... I didn't have any sermons worked up on, but I'd work them on. But I got to thinking about that, and, you know, I'm thinking, Kenny listened to me preach for 20 years and couldn't think of a sermon he'd like <laughs> to hear from me. <laughs> so anyway, you're getting new stuff this week, and I'm looking forward to preaching it because I believe it's on a topic that is very much needed. I moved to Florence, Alabama 41 years ago. As a young 27-year-old preacher that, well, I shouldn't have given you those two numbers. Everybody's doing arithmetic in their head now. But I moved here as the first preacher for the Helton Drive Church of Christ. That began meeting down on Patton Street in a warehouse. And that um, we built that building. And I spent six years here, six wonderful years in Florence and working with that congregation. But something that came to mean very much to me was the College View Congregation. They, of course, had a major role in the beginning of that work. They had fellowship with me and the preaching there and supporting of me in that work until we became self-supporting. And so many here that uh, are no longer here were a great influence and encouragement to me, as with you, Jason. And I'm so thankful for the, for the years that I spent here and for the good influence of this congregation for what it continues to have in this place. I am grateful for you, and I'm grateful you've asked me to come. I'm still not sure why, but I am thankful that you've asked me to come and be with these good men who are such effective preachers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Our theme this week is strengthening our spirits. Paul said, though the outward man is dying, the inward man is being renewed day by day. And what a tremendous blessing it is to know that, that we can be strengthened and renewed to serve God as a spiritual people. My sermons are about learning what the Bible means to be spiritual. We are to be a spiritual people. Peter speaks of us in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5 as a spiritual house. And I think understanding what it means to be spiritual is fundamental to being a child of God. And these lessons this week are fundamental lessons. Tonight is a very fundamental lesson. But it's where we need to begin if we're going to talk about being spiritual. So as we talk this week, We want to talk about being spiritual. Okay. In Galatians 6 and verse 1. All right, back up. He's got it working. <laughs> Let's back up a couple. This is why Dan Russ don't use PowerPoint.
In Galatians 6 and verse 1, the scriptures talk about being spiritual. In a passage we're familiar with, Paul says, Even if any of you be overtaken in a trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, looking to yourself, lest you also be tempted. That's a really interesting phrase, you who are spiritual, and about who he's talking about in that context. You know, I hear spirituality and being spiritual talked about in our culture today probably more than I can ever remember in my lifetime. And it's not talked about just among religious people, but people who uh, are of the world, who may be leaders in the world, who may be famous people in the world, talk about being spiritual and their spiritual life. I hear it a lot. There's a desire to have a sense of spirituality by a lot of people today. But their concept of being spiritual, I think, is something that is far removed from really what we find in Scripture. And I want to discuss that with you today. I want to give you a couple of examples Oprah Winfrey spoke at Stanford University back in April of 2015. And talking to them was trying to give them meaning of life and uh, what she found gave life meaning for her. She said, a meaningful life comes from a deep sense of awareness about who you are and why you're here. She went on to say, open your heart and quietly to yourself say the only prayer that's ever needed. Thank you, thank you, thank you. She said, you're still here. You get another chance this day to do better and better. Another chance to become more of who you were created and what you're created to fulfill. Thank you. Amen. I'm not telling you what to believe or who to believe or what to call it, but there is no full life, no fulfilled, meaningful, sustainably joyful life without a connection to the Spirit. Adding that the way to achieve such a life was through some practice. She went on to say, you must have a spiritual practice. What is yours? Well, for some people, it is going to church if that's where they nurture themselves. I believe that creativity and artful expression and prayer and conscious kindness and empathy and consistent compassion, gratitude, all are spiritual practices in the way of becoming more of who you are. Now, that's a lot to say about spirituality. And I've heard her talk about or refer to being a spiritual person a lot. But exactly where does this come from? Where does she get this idea of spirituality? Well, there are a lot of different places we can find it. But I want to give you one other example. Do any of you know who Deepak Chopra is? I'm not getting any head checks either. All right, some of you know who, who Deepak is. If you ever watch PBS television, he's on about every other night. They, they run uh, uh, speeches that he's given. He's very popular today, and people finding meaning to their life by listening to him to the things that he says. He says, instead of trying to rely on the limited resources of the ego mind, you let yourself be guided by your true self which is the source of all peace and clarity and wisdom. With clearer vision, you no longer feel confused and conflicted. Every problem has a spiritual solution. And the solution is found by expanding your awareness, moving beyond the limited vision of the problem. And the process begins by recognizing what level of awareness you are working from, then letting your inner awareness express itself. Life flows from within itself, and the more you let go, the more your true self can express its desire to evolve. Okay, I want you to go out and practice that, okay? I'll tell you, that's hard to get a handle on of whatever it is that he's talking about. But both Oprah and Deepak are talking about spirituality in their mind. That this is the concept that they think is necessary for you to be happy today. But what does it mean to be spiritual? You know, even believers in the God of the Bible and who claim to follow Jesus have ideas about spirituality that simply do not reflect biblical teaching. Have you heard people say, you know, I just feel so spiritual today? 
just the, my life, I just know, is spiritual today. I just really feel it. Or they'll come out of church and they'll say, worship was such a spiritual experience for me today. And of course, there are those who say, I just have this true spiritual feeling in my heart that makes me know that I am saved. I feel it. Well, I want us to talk about this concept of true spirituality and also how spirituality relates to our emotions and our feelings. We're going to talk about you who are spiritual and to try to get an idea of what that is about. How are spirituality and our emotions and feelings related? How are they connected? Is how I feel an indication of my level of spirituality? Can a special spiritual feeling that I have even be an evidence of my salvation, as a lot of people believe? And related to this, what is the role of emotion in our worship and our service to God? Well, I think we need to start at the beginning of this, talking about where people first get off track about the idea of what it means to be spiritual or spirituality. By talking about the role of the Holy Spirit, which is what they're relating it to, in our coming to God, in the process of coming to God. A lot of people believe that when you're talking about the role of the Holy Spirit in salvation, that they're talking about some unexplainable feeling that they have inside themselves that makes them know that they are saved. They're absolutely convinced of it because of this deep spiritual feeling that they have inside. And many believe one of the major roles of the Holy Spirit and what it plays in salvation is this special feeling, spiritual feeling that they have in their heart. Is that how the Holy Spirit confirms to us our salvation? Or does the Holy Spirit confirm our salvation in some other way? Now let me say there, there are a lot of different, differing views, and even among us as Christians, about how the Holy Spirit indwells Christians. And that's not really what I'm addressing today. I have my views on that, and you'll probably figure it out before I finish. But I believe most of us would agree that however the Spirit indwells us, that the Holy Spirit does not make us do things we otherwise would not do. That we still act upon the basis of our free will in serving God. But there are those who say that the feeling they have in their heart is the assured evidence of their salvation and the basis of their spirituality. But what is the assured evidence the Holy Spirit gives us of our salvation? I want us to go to Romans chapter 8. We're going to spend a lot of time, I'm sure, in all these lessons in Romans 8. Jason's already spent some time in it this morning. And I think sometimes we'll get so wrapped up in trying to figure out uh, which uh, occurrence of the word spirit needs to be capitalized and which ones it doesn't, that we lose the point of what he's trying to say in the context. In the context, he's talking about the mindset of one who is giving himself to the flesh and one who has the mindset of one who is giving himself to the spirit or to spiritual things. But he also talks about the involvement in the spirit and giving us testimony that we are saved. Look in Romans 8 and verse 16. He says, The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Now here he says that the Holy Spirit bears witness that we are children of God. How? How does he do that? Now, I do want us to note that he says here that the Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirit, not in our spirit. That there is a testimony that stands beside the testimony of our spirit that we are children of God. What is the testimony of the Holy Spirit about salvation and where is it revealed? What we know about the testimony of the Spirit about salvation is revealed in his word. The mind of God is made known in only one way, and we can know the mind of God concerning salvation in only this way. And that is for the mind of God to be made known to us, and that's what the Spirit of God did. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul is talking about the apostolic revelation of the Word of God. 
by the divine inspiration of the Holy Spirit. In 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 10, he says, These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thought except the Spirit of that person which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. And we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. Here he says the Spirit reveals the mind of God. God wanted us to be saved. How do we learn about salvation? By the mind of God being revealed to us by the Holy Spirit through the apostolic word. That's how we know how to be saved. The Spirit reveals what we must know in order to be saved. And what has the Spirit revealed to us about how to be saved? Well, go back to Acts 2. And there, as the apostles stand up preaching by the power of the Holy Spirit... Peter and the eleven stand up and preach Jesus Christ crucified, buried, raised from the dead, and ruling at the right hand of God. Teaching them about the blood of Jesus Christ, the sacrifice of Christ for the sins of the world. And that through him and through him alone, we can come to salvation before God. So, what happened when they heard those words, when they were convicted of their sins, when they were cut to the heart by what Peter says, when they heard these words? Well, what Peter said to them is, repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This is the Spirit's testimony about salvation. He's telling us how to be saved. He's revealing the mind of God about redemption and the process we are involved in in coming to God. And he says, here's how you do it. That is the Holy Spirit's testimony about salvation. That believers must repent and be baptized. Baptized into Christ for their mission of sins. Now, what is my spirit's testimony? How does my spirit testify with his spirit? Well, when I have done what the Holy Spirit revealed one needs to do in order to be saved, then my spirit can testify along with the spirit of God that I am saved. We are in agreement. My spirit and the spirit of God when it comes to my redemption. I have repented and I have been baptized. And now my spirit can testify with the Holy Spirit that I am a child of God, joint heirs with Christ. Provided, as he goes on to say, that we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. That is, that we will then continue to live faithfully according to the Spirit's guidance found in the word that he revealed. I mean, again, that's part of Paul's point in Romans chapter 8. That once we are in Christ, there is this continual service to God according to his will. Romans 8 and verse 4. Those who walk according to the spirit. Uh, excuse me. Those who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the spirit set their minds on the things of the spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death. But to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. For it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. The fleshly way of life, the mindset of the fleshly person, cannot please God. He is not living that life in which he is willing to suffer with God or for God that he might be glorified with him one day. The mind of the Spirit, the mindset of one who is set upon the things of the Spirit, finds life in peace. He finds acceptability to God. He says in verse 9, You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. 
if, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. He emphasizes again the choice that you have made. And because you are not in the flesh, not flesh and blood, but you are not of the mindset of the fleshly person, but in the mindset of the spiritual person. Christ is in you. God is in you. The Spirit is in you. All are influencing you to live the life of righteousness. But how do you know the righteous life? How do you know how God wants you to live? Is it because there's something unexplainable in you that's just moving you to live a good life? Is it that inexpressible feeling, that spiritual feeling that you have within yourself that just says you got to live for God and I'm living for Him? Or is it the Spirit revealed Word that is motivating you and instructing you how to live a righteous life. You don't know a righteous life without what scriptures say. The Spirit convicts us of sin. John 15 and verse 9. How? Just like they did on the Pentecost when they heard the preaching of the Spirit revealed word, they were convicted by the words that they heard. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. And ask Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? There's no other way to know if you are saved except through the knowledge of God's word. By that we will know if our names are written in heaven. Because we can see we have done what the spirit revealed word said to do in order to come to Christ. It's amazing to me how so much of the religious world doesn't get something as simple as that. And their disrespect for what the scriptures say because what they've decided is acceptable to God. You know, the Pope here recently, they, they were told of an incident that happened where there was this little boy that he was talking to. And he was crying because his father had died and his father was an atheist. And he told the Pope that. And the Pope said to him, well, don't worry. I'm sure your father was a good man and I'm sure that you'll see him in heaven. Well, that was comforting to that little boy. But I'm going to tell you something. That's not what the Spirit revealed word says. And he can give false hope of confidence to someone by saying, you know, this is what I believe and this is what I feel, even if he's the Pope. And he could be dead wrong because that's not what the Spirit revealed word says about being saved. Just remember, our confidence in our salvation is not because we have some unexplainable feeling in our chest that just assures me that I'm saved. It's because I can testify that I have done what the Holy Spirit teaches I must do in order to be saved. And what the Holy Spirit has said about that is found in the Word of God. Now, don't misunderstand me when I'm talking about emotion here. There's no question that emotion and feeling is involved in our salvation. But it comes as a result of our salvation. In our process of coming to God, we feel emotions like sorrow and joy and peace. That's a part of the process. We feel sorrow when we're convicted of our sins. And Paul said in 2 Corinthians 7 that that godly sorrow works repentance so that our heart is turning to God. We find joy. A joy that Peter described in 1 Peter 1 and verse 8 as an inexpressible joy. But where does that joy come from? He says in the context that it is the result of the salvation of your soul. And there is peace to be found. In Philippians chapter 4, beginning in verse 7, he talks about the peace of God which passeth all understanding that shall guard your hearts and thoughts in Christ Jesus. Where does the peace come from? Well, if you go back in the context and look at it, it is a result of someone in a right relationship with God, pouring out his heart to God, pouring out his cares to God in prayer, talking to his 
Father in heaven and having that relationship with him and knowing that that God cares for him because the scriptures tell him that he does. And as a result, he finds a peace of God which passes all understanding. He goes on to say in verse 9 that the God of peace will be with you. Why is the God of peace with it? Well, he just said, here's the reasons. That if you, Paul said, if you will do the things that you've heard, learned and received and heard and saw in me, if you do these things, the God of peace shall be with you. We come to God. We are saved by the blood of Christ in our obedience to the gospel. And we find the peace of God in us because we know we're seeking him and doing what he says. Sorrow, joy, and peace. Wonderful emotions. But they come as a result of our salvation. They are not in themselves evidences of our salvation. And we must understand that. We are emotional about our salvation because of the confidence we have from doing the word of God and knowing we have that wondrous forgiveness. And that even as Christians, we continue to receive the forgiveness of God through the blood of Christ as we seek to walk in the light. 1 John 1, verses 7 through 9. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all unrighteousness. He's doing that as we walk. We walk in the light. In verse 9, we're confessing still that we're a sinner. God is cleansing us because we are walking the walk that we should walk. And in that, we find joy and we find peace. And we find contentment because the blood of Jesus Christ is cleansing us. And we, have that, that we have that confidence. Well, there's another important teaching about true spirituality. As Christians, how do we know we are spiritual? Is it because we have a, a feeling of spirituality? Again, you, you know, I hear people say, you know, I just feel the love of God in me. I can just feel it in me. I know he loves me because I feel it. Or they say, you know, I know I'm truly worshiping God because of the feeling I get. I know he's accepting my worship because of how he makes me feel when I'm worshiping. Is spirituality a feeling? What is the work of the Spirit in us? Is it to make us feel spiritual? Whatever that is. I'm not sure what it means to, be feel, to feel spiritual. Everyone has a different definition of that, I think. Now note what the Bible says about what the Spirit does produce in us. In Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 through 26, very familiar passages for us. He talks about the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit that the Spirit is producing in us. And he says the fruit of the Spirit is love and it's joy, it's peace, it's patience, it's kindness, it's goodness, it's faithfulness, it's gentleness and self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Now in this context, he talks the fruit of the Spirit. He talks about the fruit of the Spirit being emotional. There is love. And there is joy and there is peace. But he also says it produces things in our life, characteristics of us, that everyone who is living by the Spirit should manifest. Patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. These are characteristics of us that say the Spirit is operating in us. And he says these are because we have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires and belong to Jesus Christ. And that if we're living by the Spirit, we're keeping in step with him. 
These are the things the work of the Spirit produces in us. Now again, alone, they are not evidence of salvation in themselves. But if we are following the Spirit-revealed teaching, these things should be a part of us. They are manifestations of what following the Spirit, the Spirit's teaching produces in us. But again, these qualities in themselves are not evidence of salvation in themselves. Understand this. I know a lot of people who are kind or who are gentle, who are joyous, who are self-controlled, but they're not saved. They haven't done what the Bible says they ought to do to be saved. But those who are Christians will manifest these qualities because they know what they have in Christ and Christ is teaching them to manifest these qualities. And the emotions will be there because of what God is doing in them. Another passage I want us to look at is in Ephesians chapter 5. Beginning in verse 15, he says, look carefully then how you walk. This is what he's talking about in context now. Look carefully about how you walk. Not as unwise, but wise. Making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, don't be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. This is what you're going to do if you're looking carefully how you walk. Now, don't be drunk with wine, for that's debauchery. He said, that's not the way one who serves God lives. But rather be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Being filled with the Spirit, he says, manifest a certain walk. Again, keeping in step with the Spirit. Being, carefully, being careful about how we walk. And the teaching of the Spirit teaches us and motivates us to do the things he says we should do here. What does he say that we would do? Well, he says that we'll want to Address one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. We'll want to sing those things. We'll want to give thanks always to God. We'll want to submit to one another in Christ. But how do we know to do those things? Is it because it just naturally comes to our heart because of some spiritual feeling that we have? No, the reason we do those things is because the spirit fear of word tells us to do those things. That's why we do them. It's not the result of an emotion. It's the result of spiritual instruction. And as we practice them, we will find that joy and peace and happiness that God wants us to have. Being filled with the spirit doesn't just mean that the Holy Spirit is inside me in some unexplainable, wonderful, miraculous way leading me to sing. No, it means that I am seeking to follow the Spirit-filled teaching that produces a person who wants to sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Being filled with the Spirit means you are influenced to live in a certain way. And this is the bottom line. Being spiritual has to do with how you live. Being spiritual is not how you feel. It is how you are living before God. Let's go back to Galatians 6 and verse 1. In Galatians 6 and verse 1, he says, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual, restore him in a spirit of gentleness, and keeping watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. What does he mean here? When he says, when there's a brother in error, I want you who are spiritual to go and restore that brother, to go and talk to him, to try to bring him back to the Lord. Is he saying, now, when there are brothers in error, I want you, brethren, who just really feel your Christianity, who just really feel that spirituality deep in your heart, you're the ones I want to go talk to. That's not what he's saying. 
He's saying, I want you brethren who have the maturity and the character of Christ who can influence that erring brother to go to him and to talk to him and to bring him back to the Lord. That's who you who are spiritual are in that context. It's people who are manifesting the character and the mind of Christ. That's what spirituality is about. I want to make one other application of this before we close tonight. Because I think it's an important one in the culture in which we live and even among brethren today. And that is what makes our worship hour spiritual. I really think this is the question a lot of people have. And I I hear it particularly from uh, a younger generation who I love and who I respect. And I can think about being younger. I, I actually can remember back that far. And I, I can remember about wanting to do things that would make me feel what I thought spirituality was about in worship. What makes worship spiritual? Is it when I feel more spiritual? When I'm more emotional in worship? Or is it when I know I am offering to the creator God Worship that I know is acceptable to him. When I'm not offering my own will worship, what I want to do in worship, but honoring him with my whole heart and in obedience to his will. That's spiritual worship. Now, I'm not saying there's no place for emotion in worship. There most certainly is. But don't define acceptable worship upon the basis of how it makes you feel. You know, some of the greatest worship hours when you manifested the most spirituality may have been when you absolutely did not feel like worshiping. It may, you get, it may be you get up on a Sunday morning and, and you're half sick and you just feel terrible, but it's the Lord's day and you decide to go. Are there personal struggles in your life or in your family or that, that just really are weighing you down and you just don't think you can get into worship today? Or maybe you are deeply depressed because of things in your life and it's just hard to get up out of bed and to go. But you decide it's the Lord's day and I'm going to get up and get dressed and go up there and try to do what God wants me to do and worship to him. And so you go, and you set your mind upon worship, despite all that's going on within yourself. And you sing praises to your God, and encouragement to your brethren, and you pray with them. And you remember the Lord's death, and you open the scriptures, and you study from his word. But you know what? You didn't feel like being there. You didn't feel any deep emotion that day, maybe during the Lord's Supper. But I want to tell you something. That may be the most spiritual worship you've offered in a long time. Because you offered it from a determined will that was going to do what God said to serve him. And you set your mind upon doing that in worship and you gave fully of yourself even though you didn't feel like doing it. God accepted that worship. And that was spiritual worship from a heart dedicated to God. And he was going to sacrifice in order to do it. Don't come to worship with your main goal being to get a special feeling. Come with a desire to offer yourself completely to God. And to honor him and to worship as he has instructed you to do. And the result of that will be peace of mind and contentment and even joy and yes even some tears shed when you remember the Lord's death or when a song is sung that has very special meaning to you that that touches you that's certainly feeling that's certainly fitting but don't think worship is more acceptable just because you had a greater emotional feeling that day you know that's really what churches shoot for today a performance by the worship leaders 
in order to give everybody an emotional rush that they can go home and leave saying, boy, that was a spiritual worship today. I just really felt the Holy Spirit being there today. And they may not have done anything that the scriptures teach them that they ought to do in worshiping God when they come together. What do the scriptures teach? Well, my intent in these lessons this week is not to try to discard emotion in worshiping our God. My purpose is to help us to understand what is the true evidence of our salvation and to help us understand what the Bible means by being spiritual. You know, I can remember the first time I partook the Lord's Supper after I became a Christian. Just a boy. But I remember that day, partaking of the Lord's Supper had a meaning for me that it had never had before. And I was struck by that. And I never forgot that, and I never forgot that day. The Lord's Supper really had meaning to me that day. And you know, 55 years later, I may be observing the Lord's Supper. And it may be that I'm really downtrodden about something. The work is not going well. There's sickness or sorrow in my family over the loss of a loved one or something that I'm struggling with. But that day, I'm there to offer of myself to God and do the very best I can in worshiping Him. And I observe the Lord's Supper as the Lord teaches me to do. Now, both of those cases I'm relating were spiritual worship. And whether I felt the emotion or I didn't, I can leave with a confident peace of mind that I have honored my God and pleased Him and that, that my worship that day was spiritual. So, when we talk about leading a spiritual life and what leads us to a more spiritual life, I don't believe it's what Oprah Winfrey said. I don't believe it's what Deepak Chopra said about trying to turn within yourself and find that level of awareness that you're at and, at and begin to figure out the clarity that is within you and, and through your true self now find the spiritual way. No, you want to lead a more spiritual life. You want to be more spiritual. Then here's what you do. You develop a deeper commitment to God in serving Him. You give yourself fully to Him as a living sacrifice. You become involved in spending every moment you can in reading His Word and learning about Him, learning the wondrous story of what He has done for you, of the nature of your God and His greatness and His power, but of His mercy and His grace. And learn from it about how you can serve God with your whole heart in your daily life and in your worship. Learn that from Scripture and establish that communication with God that is ongoing every day. Talking to Him, casting your cares upon Him, thanking Him for the wondrous things He has done for you, and that your prayer life is an integral part of every day maybe even every hour of every day. And out of that comes then living a daily life that becomes more Christ-like every day. That's being spiritual. And you who are spiritual are committed to that manner of life. It's wonderful to have an inexpressible joy as a result of our salvation in Christ Jesus. And I want us to feel that. I want us to have that. But understand, your salvation is rooted in not what you feel, but what you're committed to doing in service to God. So this week we're going to talk about that concept of true spirituality in all aspects of our lives, in seeking spiritual wisdom, in sowing spiritual things, and in building God's house as a spiritual house. These are vital to our service to God. But it may be that you need to begin a spiritual life. And you need to do it by obeying Jesus Christ. And by doing what he said to be saved. 
What made those Jews on the day of Pentecost more spiritual? They repented of their sins and were baptized into Christ for the remission of their sins. And they rose to walk a new life, a spiritual life, in service to their God. And we cannot be a spiritual people unless we are in Jesus Christ. That's what we need. And if you're not there, I plead with you to get there. To trust your Lord for your salvation and to come and to be saved from your sins and have them washed away in baptism. If you have that penitent heart and are ready to put him on tonight, we want to give you that opportunity. And we hope you'll come while we stand and sing.